on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I roll around with a tarp and at least three bushel baskets wherever I go, mid to late 19th century. We had kind of a golden age of apple diversity in the United States. There were at least 10,000 varieties going to market. You can't just grow an apple from seed and be like, well, I loved this apple, so I'm going to select a seed from this apple the way I would with a tomato. There's no predicting the outcome. I don't think people realize that all the apples they've eaten in their life are clones. Apples are made as little fermentation bombs. It almost seems like cider is, it was meant to be. Whether or not drinking cider in place of water is defensible, apples did provide a safe alternative. So it's like a source of water in a sense. It's a source of food for sure, calorically. It's a source of alcohol. Scrump as a verb, to scrump. Shake a tree and gather the apples without permission. <laughs> Just like that's so great. You're not lingering if you're scrumping. Episode number 46 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Scrump, a guide to foraging wild apples with gnarly pippins, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival specializes in naturally sourced whole food supplements that strengthen your immunity, fortify your hormone systems, and help you physiologically adapt to the stresses of our rapidly changing world. Check out Sir Thrival's colostrum and vitamin D3 for immunological and antiviral support. Their dual extracted medicinal mushroom formulas for immune system modulation and their pine pollen line for its ability to naturally boost testosterone. You can find the entire lineup at SirThrival.com. This episode is also brought to you by WildFoodWarehouse.com. Wild Food Warehouse carries North America's original staple grain, hand-harvested wild rice from the Great Lakes region. Their entire process from harvesting by canoe to the parching over a wood fire to the final winnowing all takes place right there in Minnesota. Wild Food Warehouse pays fair wages to local foragers who operate within Minnesota's strict wild rice harvesting laws. Don't be fooled by the store-bought wild rice or the stuff served in most restaurants. They call it wild rice, but in reality, it's patty-grown wild rice. Those stiff and hard-to-cook grains resemble the real thing in name only. In fact, we often joke, how do you know when store-bought wild rice is done cooking? Just throw a stone in when you start boiling it. When the stone is soft, the rice is done. (laughs) By contrast, real wild rice cooks up soft and smooth, tastes amazing, and is packed with nutrition not found in cultivated grains. Head over to wildfoodwarehouse.com to get authentic, hand-harvested wild rice. Price breaks start at 5 pounds, and the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your order. Again, that's wildfoodwarehouse.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. I've just come off a very successful bear hunt here in Maine. I harvested a beautiful boar, and for the first time ever, I'm actually out of cooler space. In fact, I had to borrow a cooler from our producer, Grant. I'd estimate this bear to be around 400 pounds, so I've got four big yetis brimming with meat and fat and packed with ice. It's a tough time of year to handle meat since the daytime temperatures are still in the 70s, so I'll be spending a lot of my spare time this week working on transitioning him from the coolers to my freezers. I'm a bit reluctant to share about my bear hunts on social media, so I'll be writing about this one in the next edition of my newsletter, The Subsistence. So if you'd like to see pictures and hear more about the hunt, head over to wild-fed.com to sign up. I put The Subsistence out every other Tuesday, so I'll be writing about this bear hunt in next week's edition. And actually, last week, I wrote about making the switch from lead to copper bullets and mentioned that my copper monolithic projectiles had worked very well on two deer I recently harvested. I mentioned that I'd be taking these same non-toxic rounds bear hunting and would report back once I knew how they performed in that context. So be sure to sign up at wild-fed.com to get next week's edition of The Subsistence, where I'll be sharing about how those rounds performed. Well, it's not just bear season, it's apple season too. And on that note, what an awesome episode I have for you today. Our guest is Matt Kaminsky, but he goes by the pen name and online moniker Gnarly Pippins, and as you listen, the meaning of that name will start to become clear. Today we're talking all about apples, and if that sounds like a sort of humdrum topic, then strap in, because the story of the humble apple is nothing short of captivating. Matt handles this topic deftly, and the pace and range of this conversation makes it irresistibly fun. 
We recorded this interview while sitting in a wild apple savanna overlooking hundreds of unique, one-of-a-kind, fruit-laden trees. And you'll be seeing some of that in a forthcoming episode of the Wild Fed TV show. Apples, kind of like dogs, give us an interesting window into domestication itself and their history, particularly their recent history, is inextricably linked to the post-1492 world of North America. There are surprises, twists, and turns, and a lot of unexpected stories that help to explain this iconic fruit's ubiquity in our culture and our food systems. From the biblical forbidden fruit to the prohibition, from cloning apples to Johnny Appleseed's rejection of these techniques as unnatural, we traverse the cultural legacy of this fruit and discuss some strategies for harvesting your own. And by the way, harvesting wild or feral apples is a great way to get started foraging. They're easy to identify, plentiful in much of the country, and don't require any processing. And unlike so many wild foods, everyone knows what to do with apples. One thing's for certain, this episode will give you a new and expanded appreciation for this all-too-common fruit. And I guarantee you'll never see apples in the same way again. Well, I'm sitting in a wall tent here in the north, northern Catskills? Northern Catskills. And that's uh, Grant Giuliano, you just heard, producer at Wild Fed. Yep. And we are here with none other than Gnarly Pippins. Gnarly Pippins! <laughs> Gnarly Pippins. <laughs> uh, Matt Kaminsky. Man, uh, nice to be here with you guys. It's really good to be here with you, man. Uh, so since arriving here, uh, we're here at Red Kill Mountain. Um, I'm going to let you introduce what this place is. But since arriving here, you've been kind of my point of contact for every question I have. And you've been uh, really opening my mind on a topic that has been of interest to me for a really long time, and that's apples. Um, so tell us who you are, uh, what your relationship with apples is and how you've, you know, kind of come to be here. All right. Well, um, my name is Matt Kaminsky. As you said, I'm known by some people as Gnarly Pippins, which is, uh, my moniker, social media handle, website, whatever, um, general nickname. And that name is sort of a nod to what we are finding around us here at Red Kill Mountain, which is wild apples. So... Red Kill Mountain is like particularly interesting piece of land because topographically it's, you know, it's a mountain, very steep sloping area with a lot of land history where at one point, of course, it was old growth forest and then went through various successions where it was farmed for pasture. It was maybe regrew into forest a little bit and then maybe again forested uh, or deforested rather. And now the final form that we're seeing at this moment is a piece of land that's covered in feral apple trees. Not trees that people, humans planted, but trees that were propagated by wildlife. So this idea of a pippin, I don't think many people know what that means. It's a term that I've I, I've encountered a lot being interested in wild food, but I didn't really know what it meant until I was driving here and I started looking it up and I still felt unclear. And then I got here and I asked you, and now I'm laser beam on it. So get everybody up to speed on what a pippin is. Well, pippin has multiple definitions, but an apple tree that's grown from seed is the, the fundamental definition of a pippin. One that was planted by seed, either by humans or by wildlife, rather than one that was grafted clonally. Mm-hmm. However, you may also run into that word, um, seeing the names of varieties of apples, named varieties, cultivated varieties, like Cox Orange Pippin, Yellow Newtown Pippin. This this word comes up a lot, but at the you, you consider that when that apple was first discovered, it was a pippin. Someone right. just found a tree growing somewhere. So it's like um, sometimes too. I'll see foods called. Uh, there's a peanut that I like that comes from South America. They call wild jungle peanut. It's like it's just a name. It's not a wild. It jungle was almost peanut. like a provisional name when yeah. somebody discovered it. I just think like sometimes people throw the word wild into things when it's not appropriate, but. In this case, we're talking about um, apple trees from seed, as you said, contrasted against cloned apples. Right. I don't think people realize, I think we'll get more into this in a little bit, but I don't think people realize that all the apples they've eaten in their life are clones. Yeah, it's kind of a disturbing thought when you finally Mm -hmm. make that realization. Hence Um, this Pippin thing. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, Real quickly, though, tell us about, uh, you went and studied horticulture, is that right? Yeah, I was sort of studying across several disciplines that that ranged from agriculture, sort of broadly, um, ecology, sustainability studies, and uh, the the particular school that I went to had the ability to roll all that stuff. I went to Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass. And so I had the ability to roll all that into a a sort of 
custom like roll your own exactly yeah you get to choose exactly what you want to focus your time on yeah. which is really valuable if you have the if you have the opportunity if to you go know to a place what you like want that. to do as well right it does take someone who's really self propelled yeah. on t- you know on the subject of what they're interested in so what when was your like initial interest in apples um ignited uh it was 2012 i believe um the school that i was going to had a lot of acreage that was formerly agricultural in fact there was a the former landowner of of the land on which this college was built was a fruit growing family called the Atkins family. And okay. they owned hundreds and hundreds of acres of orchard. If you rewind the clock back like a century, all through the, that neighborhood and the towns surrounding Amherst. So there was remnants of this orchard on the campus. And so I just saw a hugely underutilized resource just going to waste. And that really uh, something about waste. I just can't stand to yeah. waste things and see things fall by the wayside. Well, your interest was kind of in regenerative agriculture type stuff. You were looking for something that had an ecological twist to it. You were caring about plants, environment, agriculture that's sustainable. Is that what was kind of your interest at the time? Yeah, yeah. And I was I was reading a lot of literature that had to do with that, including like the One Straw Revolution and some mm-hmm. of these like foundational regenerative ag texts, okay. um, Mark Shepard's Restoration Agriculture, really another really big formative one that, that came out right around that time. And um, I was trying to see this neglected orchard through that lens. And then from there, it was just an exploration of, okay, what does what cultivated orchard look like? What does uncultivated orchard look like? And this was an example of cultivated orchard that had been let go mm-hmm. for a long time. And that really changed the the impression that it had on me and and the impression that it had within the community within like a you know a space Mm -hmm. so yeah i live in a state where there grant and i both where there's so many apple trees that have been just abandoned and they still produce fruit and it's frustrating to me because i'll see one in someone's yard and i think that person buys apples at the store Right. I know they do. When you have this really wonderful you have resource these in your front diverse, yard. diverse, interesting apples. Real apples. Yeah. Yeah. So you got interested through cultivated apples. Yeah. Um, so it, how did you get led toward this idea of wild apples and sort of the Pippin? Where, where did that come from? Yeah, it's a sort of a circuitous route because before, before I got to the uncultivated and the wild thing, I had to go through the whole course of how do you take care of apple trees? What is the convention? Why is that flawed? What would I like to see in place of that? And so that mm. that journey took between 2012 and now. Okay. And so I've just, I mean, more recently arrived where I am now, which is very, trying to be low intervention, very natural methods of propagating and maintenance and stuff. But but I was working within the, the setting of a cultivated orchard and learning about what lies along that spectrum between the two polar points. Right. You know what I mean? I want to come back to um, how modern ag grows apples. But first, I want to set some backstory. And let's rewind the clock all the way back to um, the story of the apple as far back as we kind of know. Because it's a very interesting history, right? So what I always hear is that apples were born in Kazakhstan. But then recently heard that there might be some debate about that. Maybe it's not fully clear. Just kind of curious what your take on all that is like where where's the apple from in your mind i think that yeah to paint the picture simply saying that they're from modern day kazakhstan that totally works and the reason why that works is because when you say where does the apple come from if you ask that question to anyone who's sort of new to this topic when they hear the word apple they're thinking a large fruit that's relatively sweet or tart Mm -hmm. but really if you look at the taxonomy and you look at the biology and the evolution of the apple there are a lot of different types of apples out yeah. there. There are 50, uh, as many as 55 species, which include natural hybrids. In the genus Malus. In the genus Malus. And the... the and just the, for listeners, M-A-L-U-S, right? Right. Not I-C-E, not Correct. like anger. Not hatred. Right, right. Malice, like malic acid. Exactly, mm-hmm. which apples have a lot of. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, the the modern ancestor to the apple that we know is... A, a species called Malus siversii, and that the center of biodiversity of Malus siversii is in present-day Kazakhstan. Okay, currently. However, there are, you know, over 30 other species which differ genetically 
in a more significant way from that particular species that are spread all throughout the world. Now, let's take um, my favorite analogy for talking about domestication has always been dogs because I think it's so simple for people to understand. So, um, as one... <laughs> chews uh, on a bone as the door. door. <laughs> as a chihuahua <laughs> chews a bone right there from that <laughs> rabbit we ate last night. Okay, so um, looking at dogs, there are species in the family that are not represented in the di- in the domesticated gene pool, right? So there are coyotes, mm-hmm. right? There are no coyotes mixed into our dogs, right? right? They're gray wolves. There's the red wolf, not represented in our domestic dogs. There's, foxes yeah, are... Foxes, great. So we've got all these other canids that are not in the gene pool. When we're talking about Malus domestica, that only that one species, Cerversii? Cerversii, Cerversii but Cerversii. It, it, whatever, semantics. Okay, so Cerversii is the, is the progenitor of domestica, Malus domestica. So there's all these other species spread around the world, right. but we haven't brought those into the domesticated food marketplace. Correct, at least okay. not in a meaningful way. Right. I think there is some interest among modern apple breeding programs, sure, sure. which do exist that say, oh, well, we need more disease resistance and we're going to find that in some of these other species but if you want to draw the the you know the parallel to dogs if you would say malus subversii is about as different from malus angustifolia which is the southern crab apple we find here in north america those two species are about as different as a fox and a coyote whereas a dalmatian and a german shepherd that comparison is a little more parallel to saying this is a macintosh and this is a golden russet yeah those are two domesticated varieties of, of the same species correct and they look different and they taste different and they present different phenotype but they are the same species right okay i really want people to get that into their minds because um it it's important this piece about where the apple comes from because i didn't realize until very recently i thought there was no native apple in north america and I want a, people to understand. Four. Yeah, I want people to understand that the apples that we're eating here come from domestic stock. The apples that grow here. If you know an apple tree, it comes from domestic stock. But there are these four species. So where are they distributed roughly? Well, you have three species that are widely distributed in the eastern and midwestern United States. So in the the Great Lakes area, parts of the northeast on the Appalachian Plateau, you've got the the sweet crab apple. Malus coronaria, and it does get down into the southeast a little bit. Then further south, you've got Malus angustifolia. That's the southern crab apple. These are all tiny little spitter apples. Spitters okay. meaning, you know, not really edible mm-hmm. um, or palatable, at least. They won't hurt you if you eat them, but they're not choice eating. Do we know if there's any, like, uh, ethnography, uh, ethnographical reports of them being utilized as food resources prior to, you know, colonization here? As far as I know, that's a definitive no. Really? Um, so it, they've odd, been used you know? med- medicinally, okay. and I believe okay. also in in certain preparations, probably in pemmican, in some areas where you'd find this. Yeah. I don't believe that they were used as a food crop, though. Okay. But no doubt they were useful in in the mm-hmm. the landscape for attracting wildlife for hunting grounds and improving that prior to European settlement. But as right. far as I know, it wasn't until then that these native crab apple stock that didn't become useful necessarily until they played a role in the parentage of feral apples or seedling apples after, uh, you know, mm-hmm. 1492 or whatever. Right. So up until 1491, there were many indigenous groups on this continent that would have been familiar with the genus, but not with the species that we brought here. Correct. Okay. And, and you know, even further Midwest and even the West Coast. So this was a continental sort of thing. There are four species native to here, and there are... There are Dozens more in the Eurasian Around, continent. Okay. What were, what so, were so the talking, last two native ones? Uh, the Midwestern native Malus species is called Malus ioensis, and the common name is the prairie crab. And then the Pacific crab, Malus fusca, that's that's like Pacific Northwest up into the Aleutians and parts of Alaska. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Any of those palatable or all, all spitters? I haven't had the, the, the privilege of trying either of those, um, the, the prairie crab or the Pacific crab, but both the... the, the Sweet crab and the southern crab, which we find out east. I've had both of those, and I, f- I find them pleasant. But sweet that's crab sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's sweet and then a lot of other stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but That term crab apple, you said, sort of does have a loose definition? Um, I think it has a pretty firm definition. Oh, please, um, lay it on us. And, yeah, the, the reigning authority on crab apples 
will say that it's just an apple under two inches in diameter. So it doesn't mean that it's not an edible... I mean, obviously, they're all edible. It doesn't mean it's not a pleasant-to-eat apple. Correct. That's it a cultural ju- connotation yeah, that, that that's has been a lot a to do with... A layer that's been added on. Yeah, exactly. It's a label that is not accurate and doesn't speak to the quality of all crab apples. I've had a natural inclination, maybe you have two, to forage my whole life, even before I knew properly anything about the plants I was eating. I would just find stuff as a kid... You know, that I'd be like, you know, shepherd's purse would be one that oh, I would I eat. Oh, I love or shepherd's purse. Japanese knotweed was one I found I could eat the shoots of. Or there's just like lots of plants that I would mess around with like that. And um, so over the years, I ate many apples that people told me were going to give me a stomach ache because it's a crab apple. And I'd be like, what are these fools talking about? This is so good. And you would eat it with impunity, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, tons of them. And I would enjoy them so much. And you'd get these flavors that were just, it makes... You know, store-bought apples feel sometimes like mushy, like too sugary. Insipid. Yeah, no, like cloyingly sweet. Right. You know? Um, so anyway, I find that really interesting. Okay, so back to Kazakhstan. There we have the center of genetic diversity for the this particular species. Yeah, the progenitor <clears throat> of the But there, there, it's not domestica. It's Correct. Okay. Um, out of that comes the domestic food crop how long ago? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I don't know if anyone has found archival evidence of a, s- a specific year or range yeah, of, of dates prob- that you could find. Not, but but I mean, do the Egyptians have it? Do the Greeks have it? Are we talking thousands of years or was it more I think 1,000 plus. Mm-hmm. could be close to 2,000, but I don't know quite how many. I mean, I, we're looking at trade routes because we're thinking, when was Kazakhstan, when was that region connected to other parts of the Eurasian continent and when when were natural products and agricultural or or you know wild crafted products at that time circulating because the flow of genetics across ge- different geographies is when cultivation begins okay so when you see you know apples going to Hungary and Turkey and migrating further west towards the you know Iberian peninsula eventually where you see very, very rich apple cultivating cultures in France and England and Spain, you see that, you know, named varieties appear as early as the late 1400s. Oh, wow. So very, very old. I mean, we would consider that like ancient, six Mm -hmm. centuries ago. Yeah, I mean, a car's antique in 25 years, right? Something like that. Totally. Um, (laughs) Man, it's a... The thing that is most fascinating to me about apples and why I think it's so easy to have a real deep dive on this fruit is the fact that its seeds do not breed true to the fruit that you first taste, right? right. So, um, the, and this leads us into the cloning conversation. I want to get into that in a second. So tell us about what happens when, let's imagine an apple is eaten by a bear and it's got five seeds plus in it and that bear goes and shits and all those apples propagate. Right. What's going to, What's the relationship of those apples, even though they'll be genetically parented by this apple that the bear ate, how will they differ from the apple that uh, grows out of those seeds? Well, that would be a really awesome set of five trees to see right in a cluster because <laughs> you'd imagine they'd be growing right out of the same, you know, one star foot pattern. Radi- yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, they're all going to be different in a lot of ways. And those those ways go far beyond what the fruit actually looks like. If you focus on the fruit for a second, just to start there, you'll see... Probably they all have, if not totally different, um, you know, substantially differing color patterns and skin patterns. So those can those can manifest in different ways. You might have some that are splattered with different colors. You might have some that are striped. You might have some that have a lot of different small dots around them. Mm-hmm. These are all things that are controlled by genes. And so the the heterozygous nature of apples means that every single one of them is going to express different parts of the genetic, you know, blueprint of, mm-hmm. of malice. So that does depend a little bit too on where this bear took a dump. Because mm-hmm. if you're in an area that has a malice coronaria, crab apple right nearby, when those seedling trees grow and get to the age where they're producing flowers, whatever, you know, the, the pollen parentage of the seeds that grew is also that's the second half of the genetic picture. It's not just the seeds 
parent. It's like also what, oh, yeah. what, cause apples need to be cross pollinated in order to produce fruit. Okay. Because the, the flowers self have, no, there are some self fertile apples, but it's, it's rather uncommon. It's very common for apples to need some different genetic specimen to pollinate them. And that's, that's the, really the underlying reason why you get different apples from every seed. Because if they were all the same or similar, there's a chance that their their you know success rate in producing fruit and therefore seed would be much lower. Especially if there's an environmental change or something yeah, like that. Yeah, totally. Pest. So in other words, when I take an apple and I cut it open, um, what, would that, what would that be? In a transverse, yeah, set, yeah, you know, from in the a side. transverse cut from the side, yeah. And I, I open up that star pattern of, what did you call those um, spaces inside the apple? Each seed cell is called a carpel. Okay, so when I'm looking at those carpels and that they've each got a seed in there, each one of those seeds is for a different fruit. Yeah. And that's what's so fascinating. So you can't just grow, this is going to lead us into the Pippin thing. You can't just grow an apple from seed and be like, well, I loved this apple, so I'm going to select a seed from this apple the way I would with a tomato. If I was like, oh, I love this tomato, I'm growing seeds out of this tomato. Totally. With an apple, it's like, I love this apple, I'm going to plant seeds from it, and then I get five radically different trees that produce fruit that looks different, tastes different, different sizes. There's no um, predicting the outcome, right? Of course. Which, boy, that to to modern agriculture is like, no. <laughs> yeah, that's, right? it's on the absolute other extreme of what they need, which is like uniformity and predictability. Yeah. yeah. And they want to know that they've got an apple that's going to ship and keep yeah. well, right? Because that's what's crucial to the distribution. So... Um, so what did they end up describe? And this, this quality, I was calling it yesterday, extreme heterozygosity. Is that, am I saying yeah, it right? Yeah, you got it right. Okay. So extreme heterozygosity is this tendency to produce offspring that aren't, um, necessarily a kind of a duplicate replication of what the, what the parentage was. Right. Okay. So, um, how then did they overcome that in agriculture? Why can I go buy a golden delicious every day of the week for the rest of my life? Well, the reason why is because of a process called grafting. And grafting is a form of clonal propagation, and it's not only in apple trees. I mean, tons of trees need to be grafted because of similar heterozygous things. Some Sometimes tomatoes even get grafted for oh, no different purposes. Um, but it's a process that you'll see pop up in a lot of horticulture. And the way you do that is by taking two specimens that are distinct and joining them together so they're growing as one. So it's it's kind of like skin grafting in a way. If you've, if anyone is unfortunate enough to have had that happen to them or whatever, but you take cuttings from the desired fruit variety, you cut them when the tree is dormant, and it has to be one-year-old growth. It has to be the new growth of the tree. And then by carefully incising into the wood and aligning the, the cambium layer, which is essentially the the highway of nutrients yeah. within the tree. It's where it's where sap and nutrients are transported as well as plant hormones. Um, sap sap wood right under that is also a, you know, that's another important piece of the tree to keep in mind when you're when you're grafting because the sap flow plays a very important role. But if you you have to line up the cambium layer on both the uh, the scion stock, which is the word you use to describe the f- desired fruit variety, is the scion scion. S C I O N. Yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah. And the the receiving stock, the or, or the root stock, you have to line up the cambium from both pieces in order to get a successful graft. And that happens between winter and spring, and it takes about three to four weeks, maybe two to four weeks, to start seeing that scion start to push new growth after you do the graft. Okay, and this, so the tree just accepts this new piece. This is why I've been to apple trees that have several different types of fruit on them. Because yeah, you multiple could graft trees. Theoretically have a tree that had infinite number of as much as you could fit, right? Like yeah, that's like the number one like party trick for the horticulturalist. Is okay. like, look at my tree. It's, it's multiple a, fruits. Yeah. Right. However, as you and I were talking about recently, if we did this with animals it would be horrifying. Totally. If I was taking a sheep that had a head that I like and the sh- a sheep that had a body I like and joining them People would be mortified by this. You'd and they be jailed. Pro- <laughs> and they probably wouldn't buy it as food. Yeah, no, definitely um, not. So at some point, somebody's got a pippin, mm-hmm. an apple from seed. And this apple tree produced a golden delicious. And they were like, this is a great apple. They can't plant the seeds and get it back. So they start grafting this on to rootstock or other trees, correct? Mm-hmm. 
And then as that material grows out, you can harvest it again and you just keep doing this, right? So every Golden Delicious that a person listening has eaten or Red Delicious or Cortland or Mac or whatever it is, every single one has been a genetic duplicate clone of every other one, correct? Exactly. Every it's, Red Delicious I've had and every one that Grant's had have been the same one. It's been a clone of the original tree. Yeah. And, you know, there are there are a couple exceptions to the rule in that, you know, with something like Macintosh or Red Delicious, one of these apples that's been played out so, so hard, um, there are mutations that occur. Like, mutations happen. Yeah. You know, we could be looking at an apple tree together that's full of fruit and you wouldn't know this until you took the time to grow out every seed from that tree, but you would, you would find every once in a while, oh, it's kind of like the parent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with, with grafted red delicious trees or whatever, you'll get m mutations that happen. And sometimes you taste it up and you're like, hmm, that's kind of different, different than a red delicious. Let's clone it. Let's clone <laughs> it. And so those, those mutations are often selected as new varieties too and grafted from there. So you, you, it's, it's really like a, a, a microcosm situation where you've got different levels of cultivation mm -hmm. that are possible. And people, humans generally have gone to the most, you know, selective level of cultivation mm -hmm. over time. So is there, go ahead, sir. No, please go ahead. Is there any way for humans to select certain traits of an apple and try to continue that on like from I guess, seed, yeah you mean? or yeah because it's hard for me to imagine a red delicious being a pippin at one point like seeing all these different pippins out here yeah it's like they're all of a small like different shapes on the tree well th this is again coming back to what's the what's the apple history of this place you know if there was if, if you if you find a grove like we are lucky enough to be standing in here at Red Kill Mountain, but th these these places exist. Um, if you're lucky enough to find a place, you consider the apple growing history of the area. Was it a cultivated orchard? Was there an orchard industry here? If so, what are the varieties? And these are some of the apple detective kind of clues that I'm asking when I find a place like this. And I say, oh, is it likely that there was large scale apple growing, or was it smaller homestead farms that had diverse cultivated apples for both eating and for cider or whatever or was it like large scale red delicious land mm -hmm. and so the pippins that you're going to find out in the world are going to be molded by that because that is the genetic blueprint um even though um they're they're all going to be different you once you start to see you know the bigger picture and cast a really wide net and have tasted a lot of apples you can say Okay, like I'm sort of starting to get to the some characteristics are carried forward from yeah, the parent. Yeah, because because there is shared DNA mm -hmm. between the parent and the offspring yeah, apple trees, and right. so, uh, you know, on my journey, I'm I'm just breaking into that now and starting to connect more dots in this constellation. Right. But it's, you know, it's not absolute randomness. Right, right. There's right. no way it could be absolute randomness. Right. At the same time, though, and I want to come back to your question here in a sec, G, so make sure I do because I want to also respond to it. Um, I, I keep reading these things that'll say, like, well, there there's as many as 50,000 varieties of apples in the world. This and true. I'll be like, well, that's not that impressive to me now that I understand. Of course there are. Like 50 million, if maybe. Everyone, right? yeah. If every tree produces its own unique fruit if it comes from seed, then there would be infinite variety of apples or at least as many as there are pippins. Right. Right. So as many pippins as there are in the world, there are that many varieties, not necessarily have bearing names and having ever been marketed, but there would be that many as there are pippins, there are that many. It's a little bit varieties. much to wrap your mind around, right? It's kind <laughs> of, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. But also to Grant's point, which was, well, I'm not seeing anything out here in this forest of apples that kind of resembles like a like a red delicious. So it's hard to imagine, but you're also, you got a picture G like those are trees put into orchards with nothing around them pumped with nitrogen. So they're producing these huge uniform shiny fruits because uh, in addition to the grafting, it's all of the, you know, the artificial the agricultural yeah. practices. Yeah. yeah. So what else, like just uh, zip back for a second to the cloning. Um, what else is kind of going on on apple in commercial apple orchards that the listener who thinks of an apple as a sort of a natural food might not know about well quite a lot um <laughs> I, I don't even know where to start it, it's a, a very large iceberg that I'll, I'll try and scratch yeah. the tip of 
Hey, we'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first, we've just restocked our Hunter Orange Wild-Fed Trucker hats, and they're on sale just in time for the upcoming hunting season. Right now through October 15th, get 25% off any hat at wild-fed.com. If you plan on getting out this fall, make sure you stay safe and legal. Get yourself one of our Blaze Orange Snapback Truckers. Even if you aren't hunting, it's a good idea to wear Hunter Orange in the woods during the hunting season. Every year here in the U.S., there are firearm accidents that could have been avoided by simply wearing this color, which, incidentally, is the most visible color to the human eye. Me, my wife, and our dog all wear Hunter Orange during the firearm season whenever we're in the woods, whether we're hunting or not. Wild-fed Hunter Orange hats are extremely high quality. They fit and look great. You can find them at wild-fed.com. Now, back to the show. Chemical inputs that are uh, administered in the form of spray are probably the Aerially? biggest. Um, no, usually with, with broadcast sprayers that are yep. towed behind tractors. Sure. Aerial spraying is is possible. It is practiced some places, but much less common. That's yep. for like high roller conventional orchardists because that's a big investment to run airplanes or whatever. But right. um, pesticide, broadband applications that just kill all bugs, essentially. Because a lot of organic apple growers say it's very difficult to do organically, or I've been told that a lot. It's difficult to grow organic apples for for a, for a consumer right. who is expecting and wo- isn't willing to pay for fruit that looks mm-hmm. a certain way, that has certain types of pock marks and blemishes. Yeah. So, you know, large applications and consistent applications of pesticide is totally commonplace, even in organic. Mm-hmm. Um, the different chemicals still that have slightly different mechanisms of of killing bugs, but you know, if you see one that says organic, it's going to receive just as much pesticide as a conventionally grown one. Wait, why? Because there are organic pesticides. Oh, understood. And conventional pesticides. There are different chemicals with different mechanisms of killing bugs, but they're, they receive just as much. And then the other, other really crappy thing that most people don't know about that goes on in commercial orchards is that the, the ground on, you know, three or four feet on either side of the trunk in a huge strip following the whole row is just herbicided probably once a week or once every other week because wow. keeping weeds down prevents uh, or, or enables the, the apples to grow to like two or three times the size of what they would be otherwise. Because they're not competing for those nutrients? Yeah. And so the wow. effect of that is that you just, you get tons of people spraying Roundup and other other mm-hmm. kinds of herbicides really, really harming the soil health and... Potentially being systemic in the... Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if there are sprouts from the apple tree's roots coming up and they get hit with the herbicide, you poison the tree too. Mm -hmm. So that's something that a lot of people don't know about. And then sometimes in like wash washing stations and pack sheds, um, a wax is rubbed on the apples. That's a huge pet peeve of mine. Some people think like, oh, it's probably just in my imagination, but no, they're no. It's like it's like somebody's rubbed a candle on these things. I know. Obviously, a food grade you know, quote unquote food grade wax. And but the, this is used it for extending shelf life. Yeah. So you which, can't get it off really. Yeah. Yeah. You put, take soap to that. It doesn't really come off. You got to peel those apples. I hate that. Um, also the trees themselves though, they, um, you know, we're seeing big diverse trees here. Mm-hmm. Um, in the orchard, they are using, there's more and more tendency toward these dwarf trees. Right. The dwarf trees, you can fit more trees per acre maximize how many apples you're taking off the land. And so in, in a sense, you, you have to think of it like an extractive industry. Mm-hmm. You're extracting nutrients in the form of apples from the soil. Mm-hmm. And the forms you're replacing those nutrients in are usually synthesized fertilizers. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the, the goal is to make a stressed out tree because a stressed this out the, tree this is crazy has me, the, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the, the explain, doctrine. Explain this. Sorry, I just interrupted you. Totally, with my no, it's all good. Explain it. So a stressed out tree produces more and bigger fruit? Not necessarily bigger, but okay. just a more a prolific bloom okay. of blossoms and therefore more prolific bearing. So, um, you know, trees that are intentionally devigorated mm-hmm. uh, so that they don't have a whole lot of vegetative growth made to, you know, activate mechanisms within the apple tree that say, oh, I'm, I'm dying. Like, I yeah. don't have much longer. But, you know, then spraying the fruit with a lot of, you know, chemicals because the tree in this weakened state doesn't have a lot of natural mechanisms of of warding off disease and pests the way that 
big old healthy adult apple trees do. Um, so you have this kind of sickening combo going on. I don't want to demonize grafting, but mm-hmm. it's it's just the the systematic weakening of apple growing stock that is responsible for for that whole thing. Trying to stress the tree out as much as possible so There's that it produces. There's some human diseases like, that'll do this, where like in the lethal stage of the the disease, you have a really high sex drive, and they think wow. for this reason. I'm pretty sure that. Um, and it's, I hate to say it on a podcast and be wrong about it, but I'm, I think that um, rabies is like that. So there, you know what I mean? You you know you're dying, so there's this desire to quickly propagate, Whoa. you know? So it well, makes it, it makes sense. That's a, but that's a life thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like a, a, a mechanism within. Continuation of life. Thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So let's contrast it now with where we are because we are in an apple forest. It's a, Not it's, an orchard, but like a forest of apples. It's amazing. I would call this a savanna. Yeah, yeah. Because if we consider the ecotype that we're in, sure. I mean, there are areas that are forest, but with the intervention of all the wildlife that are here, deer, bear, porcupine, the list goes on, and with humans that are sustainably stewarding the land, we have a really interesting ecotype. It's mm-hmm. there, there are meadows that are growing annual herbaceous plants all throughout, but this whole place is dotted with wild feral apple trees that are growing in um y- not in uniform rows you know what i mean They're in great. thickets that yeah. Are, yeah some of them are gnarly out. pippins some of them are <laughs> definitely gnarly, <laughs> gnarly pippins. pippins um w- it it's taken me a little while to shift my eyes from apples everywhere to an interest in the unique differences you ever see like every tree you ever see a group of kids like walking down the street and they're wearing like what basically the same outfit the same (laughs) shoes the same haircut uh but then you look close and you realize there's little variations and they don't realize how similar they are they they're like oh yeah no mine are the blue ones you know hers are the pink ones or whatever like little differences it's like that it's like i'm seeing all these apples and then i i like half of them are kind of a green or yellow color half of them are more red but then today, as we were harvesting, I started to notice some look like they've been streaked with a paintbrush. Yeah. Right? Some look like they've been polka dotted, you know? Some just have that russeting that you were describing as like a very delicate, almost like a lace that's been drizzled over right. them. That's right? That's one of my favorite, you know, patterns Like to somebody's find taking an gold and, and drizzled totally. liquid gold on them. Um, some are completely russeted. Yeah. Right. Uh, some are quite large. The whole tree is producing, you know, larger fruits. Some are, the whole tree is producing small fruits and you start to see all these subtle variations. And then every apple we've tasted has been different. It's crazy. And, and they're all good. That's what's so They're wild. all good in their own way, but they, yeah. you know, they're, there's apples for many different purposes. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's one of the things I talk about in my book a lot is like knowing how to grade the harvest. If you're someone who's new to foraging or new to apples in general and new to all the apple flavors that exist out there, knowing what to do with an apple that makes you want to like close your eyes and shake your head really fast because it's so bitter and tannic. Um, you know, that's that's something that you're going to want to blend in cider rather than say, I can try to get through a pot of applesauce right. of this stuff. Um, right. But those f- same flavors you maybe don't like that taste of in that format in cider are going to add all these complex notes, right? That actually really elevate the cider. Absolutely. Right. But then some of these apples, you're like, ooh, this tree is just a straight up eater. Like, I just want to eat these ones. Yeah. I mean, there are apples in this place that we've all visited that are, you know, like that, that very mild, sweet one that I, I'm mm-hmm. reminiscing about now that was very sort of oblate and streaked and beautiful and this kind of picture perfect apple i could just eat bags of those Mm -hmm. all day long you know so you do find trees that you could say oh that's worthy of the next supermarket variety yeah but you know it's it's all about um keeping it diversified and having having the the difference there that you can appreciate between them yeah, I mean, I've just, that's what I've appreciated the most is this, all this variety here. Something that you told us uh, yesterday, which I had never heard before, and as the evening went on and I sat with what you'd said, it made more sense to me that at the base of the apple, the part that's growing away from the tree, um, that there is a sort of a, a entrance tube into there mm. and yeasts get up into the core of the apple. And you were saying eating the core of the apple is a really good practice, um, particularly I would think with 
fruits that come off of a landscape like this, that you're getting um, almost kind of a probiotic impact. You're getting all this flora. Absolutely. Right. Um, can you describe that a little bit more clearly than I just did? <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, I can try. Um, it, you know, in in the interest of giving credit where credit's due, I, I learned about this from um, the Shockies, who are a really amazing family from Oregon, who who wrote a great book um, from story publishing on making miso. And so they they have this very deep knowledge of, of fermentation, of, you know, microbiota and, and different cultures that exist. And what they were um, teaching me and my, my bosses is that, you know, the apple blossom, because that is collecting yeast from different pollinators, from different insects in the springtime, from a variety of wildflowers, including, you know, trees that bloom, meadow plants that bloom you know they're they're transporting yeast in the early part of the season before other antagonistic sources of yeast have gone as airborne as they will early into the summer through through the fall that sort of micro microcosm is is enclosed in Inside the apple, the apple. Yeah. because once the the actual petals fall away and the stamens, the male elements, once those sort of wither and become the calyx of the apple, which is the the butt end, mm-hmm. um, you know that it's just a little time capsule inside the apple yeah. of this of this very clean, um, yeah, uncontaminated yeast, yeah, yeah. right? It's like it's not like it's picking up other stuff so much. It's sort of sealed up in there. And you can sealed, you can but... e- you know use utilize that yeast. Yeah. You can harvest blossoms and pitch it into a sourdough starter, or, or initiate yeah. things that you're fermenting with that because it's a very very desirable kind of yeast that that ferments things in the way that humans generally like to have yeah, things. It's not fermented. like you need anything to kick off a cider, man. You just get some apple, press them, right? And I mean that stuff is ready to. It's roll. ready to roll. They're they're Apples are made, you know, as little fermentation bombs. It almost seems like cider is, uh, you know, it was meant to be. Let's loop around to that for a second because um, the history of apples has is an interesting one. Um, and things, our relationship with the apple tremendously changed around the Prohibition, right? So totally. So kind of talk us through a little bit about that. Well, Prohibition... Um, at one point, it was federal, and this was like nationwide. We have apple growing regions. Constitutional amendment. Yeah, so we have we have apple growing regions that are really being affected by this because the apples that they're growing are not going to have economic value unless they, you know, standardize and start growing fruit for other purposes, and that that affected not only the variety of fruit but also the grade that people would, you know, be willing to pay for. As but backing up a little bit from that, oh, like oh, prior sure, sure, to sure. that, I mean. Apple was uh, seen as an alcohol source by a lot of people, correct? I yeah, mean, it by had a lot a reputation. of people. I think in the years leading up to Prohibition, it, there was that, you know, division among people from a cultural standpoint. That's like, oh, well, those those apples, those are cider apples. That's the devil's fruit. And yeah. it wouldn't be uncommon for people who were staunch Prohibitionists to go chop down seedling apple trees because yeah. they did not believe that any it's good would come Debauchery is coming from yeah, that. Yeah, it's the yeah. devil's fruit. Right. Um, which and alcohol, is, I mean, alcoholism, the prohibition was a response to rampant alcoholism yeah. in the United States. It's not like people were in balance with how they were, you know, I mean, alcohol breaks at work, you know, the totally. introduction of, of whiskey because you And were apple corn. brandy was, was a, there was major production okay, so that's of, of apple brandy. that's distilled apple cider, basically. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so people are drinking heavily. And then there's also this thing you hear all the time that the colonists had a distrust of water because of, of waterborne illnesses that they'd either experienced, you know, in Europe or here. Mm-hmm. And so there was a tendency to drink a lot of cider because they felt it was safe. Yeah. Right. But obviously anybody who's made cider at home knows that in about two, three days, you're getting a little bit of a kick every time you drink. Oh, well, they, they weren't drinking fresh cider. Yeah. To, I'm sure they they were, were drinking hard cider. Yeah, of course. And that's it, what I'm saying. You can't, fresh cider only state without preservatives in it. Fresh cider is only fresh cider so long. Right. I mean, it well, doesn't, it that, ferments quickly. That's an interesting point. And it, it, it does help to back up even further to that point, because whether or not drinking cider in place of water is defensible <laughs> to a modern standpoint, <laughs> um, you know, in, in areas where people were living and farming and set up, you know, that were low lying or had wetlands where there was water, fresh water, but it was stagnant yeah. water and it's and not safe to drink. cattle everywhere, yeah. Exactly. So apples did provide a safe alternative because the fermented cider... 
you know, the harmful bacteria won't thrive and won't survive in an alcoholic environment. You can water that cider down a little bit, it, you know, and lower the alcohol content to a point where there are going to be less harmful mm-hmm. pathogens in there. Um, and there's a thing called cider kin, which is where you rehydrate spent apple pomace, and that's what you make for the kids. So, you know, it, it was not the same hard cider that we're, we're yeah. getting in, like, fancy wine bottles now. Right. What, what you're referring to is really, like, a different culture of drinking cider. Yeah. And this was, this was really early on in, in colonialism and, you know, that very bloody period. Um, but if we go a little forward towards Prohibition... Well, can I add one piece, which yeah, is that, that uh, I would imagine, you know, today it's like I go to the store and I can choose from, I got balsamic vinegar, white vinegar, sherry vinegar, apple cider vinegar, right? All these choices. But when you're at the homestead level, especially then, I imagine apples were your source of your vinegar and you've got to go through, to get that acetic um, acid, you've got to go through the alcohol stage totally. first, right? So you've got to make a cider and then anaerobically and then you've got to aerobically let that alcohol be consumed by acetic organisms who turn it into vinegar right? exactly so also like very apple tree is this source of so it's like a source of water in a sense yeah it's a source of food for sure and calorically it's a source of alcohol which has been since it was discovered kind of pretty central to how civilizations work i always right. joke civilizations and alcoholic because it's since i mean I, I think the domestication of wheat can argue and rice and all of these can arguably be as much about alcohol as it was about calories in a sense. Right? Sure. And um, yeah, cause, they, cause you, you know that, uh, you know that thing that they say like anthropologists, like why would we ever leave hunting and gathering for the hard lifestyle of the agriculturalists? And it's like, well, cause you could get liquored up. It's like yeah. worth introducing that into the conversation. Cause I think that's a component. So apples are, are in, in part this. Definitely. Um, so, but then, one thing I've also heard is that when the prohibition was, you know, which was connected to the women's suffrage movement, I believe, right? So women are saying kind of something like men are drunk all the time. And they're abusive. And they're abusive. Yeah. And they're, and this is a problem. Um, and that the idea that the fruit of the knowledge, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that leads, you know, because this religion paradigm is tied in with Very these colonists, closely. right? that it's not named as an apple in the Bible at any level, but it becomes the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil because it's associated with alcohol and debauchery. And so now it's Eve ate the apple, right? Right. Not the fruit, but the apple, right? Cause now it's the sinful fruit because we're trying to draw it, it attention to the cider problem. for that movement. Yeah. Right. Okay. So sorry, I'll, I'll leave it there. So no, absolutely. I mean, that's a good, that's a good point to bring in. I don't, I don't truthfully exactly remember what the next piece in that is, but you know, just, just working towards prohibition, there was there was a long time between the time when people were like struggling to make it through winter and then when prohibition actually was right. enacted. Um, and during that time, we had kind of a golden age of apple diversity in the United States. There were at least 10,000 apples going to market. And I mean, 10,000 varieties. That's amazing. And it was because of the, the lack of, um, you know, trade by railway. Yeah. Things wouldn't make it that far. Right. You'd make it to the nearest big city, maybe, and that's it. So, so apples were being selected from seedling stock and propagated on a village scale. So you had this really cool mosaic of like, oh, that's an old Ohio apple. Well, right. there's a there's a history there, and because when I go to the go to like the Common Ground Fair up in Maine, <laughs> there's a fellow there that puts out a table of. I mean, he that would people be, bring him his apples. And yeah, you know who I'm talking about. I know just who you're talking about, John okay. Bunker, okay. my hero, and just generally oh, yeah? accepted as the reigning authority on on apples, not only in Maine but in America. Okay, so he knows all the heirlooms. I mean, uh, people are bringing apples. You know what? This is on my property. What is it? Um, but at that time, it's this mosaic you're talking about is in part because people are separated. The transportation between places is more challenging. Everybody's got their local varieties, right? Are yeah. they grafting them? They, they are grafting a, them. Okay, and, so they're, and that's why they're I don't growing from seed stock. Grafting. Yeah, I get it. I am I probably shouldn't be so heavy-handed about that. Oh, but it's okay. They grow from seed. They get an apple they like, a pippin they like, and then they start grafting that, and that becomes local to them and gets probably named after a person or a trait of the apple or whatever, Exactly. Right? Until you have... This ten thousand varieties. Yeah, because this is taking place all over, and and but also most of these are being grown for cider production or vinegar production, or they are eating them as well. These <clears throat> these apples from this era, you know, in the mid to late nineteenth century, it, you get a range. You get 
apples for eating, apples that are specifically Cooking. for molasses yeah, okay. and making. You get apples oh, that are yeah. specifically for hard cider, and there's right. there's a whole range, just like the kinds that we're you know we're talking about today and at this at this particular place. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you also considered people people weren't like flipping on the TV and right. <laughs> getting a TV dinner when they get home. It's like oh, I'll go through the nursery catalog and order some new apples. It's yes. like there was a culture of growing apples that mm-hmm. doesn't exist in the same way now. And that culture was sort of disrupted as a symptom of prohibition because, you know, people had the, the boot on their throat for economic survival. This was also leading up to the Depression, keep in mind. Mm-hmm. And so agriculturalists had a hell of a time making a living in the East because with larger acreage in the Northwest that could grow these big, beautiful dessert apples for lower cost per acre with less spray and could do more of it. Eastern orchardists, you know, New York State, New England, the Pennsylvania and the Great Lakes, it's like they're they're gone. Mm-hmm. So they, they sold off a lot of their stock. A lot of the agricultural land got turned to dairy or other types of other types of farming. And so you, you had this tremendous loss of both culture and actual trees. Right. Okay. And then tell us, I know that I'm probably backtracking quite a bit here now. I'm jumping all over with this, but this Johnny Appleseed story, explain how he, his relationship to the Pippin versus his relationship to the grafted tree. Sure. You know? Johnny, Johnny Appleseed, his real name being John Chapman. Um, he was a Massachusetts man, um, but he, he was a, a staunch staunchly religious person he he belonged to the swedenborgian faith oh he was yeah he was yeah and it's an interesting um sect of the church it is it? yeah and as a as a part of his faith he believed that grafting was not the way that god intended yeah and so he only planted trees from seed and he planted a hell of a lot of them and he was a you know partially nomadic person he would seasonally go from the northeast to the ohio valley and made several trips back and forth because this was a time when the Homestead Act was causing people to migrate west, mm-hmm. start homestead farms. And they need the, or they need apples. Yeah, not only from a survival standpoint, but the government mandated as part of the Homestead Act to get your forty acres, you needed to have this many apple trees, oh, this okay. many pear trees. Um, so it was actually mandated in the in the agreement of like, yeah. So the, so the so government he's like kind of exploiting that market because he knows people have to have well, these apples. They got to get them somewhere. Exactly. He he made his money off of that. And he was a very wise businessman. People people think of him as like a poor shoeless hippie, but he actually, you know, he he made Shrewd. he made his living doing this, selling seedlings, selling seedlings from seedling nurseries, which he nurseries. would not know the quality of fruit of, because they were seedlings, right? And it wasn't so much that like you were going to get apples that would be predictable, you know. He, yeah. I think I think a combination of him being like, I love seedling apples because I'm a man of God, you know yeah, that sort of right, thing, right? Um. That combined with the fact that he just needed to get people trees because people had this mad yeah. dash to get, get out yeah. to the West. So It's just neat circling it around to where we are today because um, we're not, I don't think any of us sitting here are Swedenborgian, but we <laughs> <laughs> we have a similar mentality in that a preference for the wild versus a preference for the manipulated, right? Definitely. And, so, and it... it it comes from a sort of, for me at least, like a spiritual relationship to wild things because of this idea that nature is a super intelligence, that, that sometimes our meddling, often our meddling is a less intelligent, leads to a less intelligent outcome. Definitely. And I feel kind of that we share something in, in that. Um, so I like that story because I can relate to that character. You know, Definitely. it's like, it's neat thinking back like, oh, people were on it then, you know, like I like that. Yeah. The ideas aren't necessarily yeah. new. It's just that you have to isolate and find the figures throughout history where you're like, oh my God, that idea was really consistent with mm-hmm. how I'm approaching it. Yeah. So here we are today and apple trees are abandoned all over parts of the country. Um, many trees like some of the ones like many of the ones here but where i'm saying like at home many trees that are that i'll forage from aren't necessarily um abandoned trees a lot of them are pippins right because people Definitely. throw apples animals eat apples and so there's these apple trees all around how, how does like the apple forager get started and in you know how you know what advice do you have to people to kind of get started well, I think that the most important thing is just to start training your eyes for identification because you, you know, 
that's that is pretty central to actually being able to interact with the trees being like oh i can see there's an apple tree over there or that that kind of environment looks like the kind of place where you might find an apple tree Mm -hmm. um and so just a couple quick tips for the beginning forager is to know sort of the general attributes of of apples as a forest tree they're they can't grow as tall as the north american natives beech birch maple etc pines whatever they're never going to be able to compete in a dense forest stand like that they're an edge species so they'll grow on the edges of places where there is more sunlight available. Mm-hmm. That's also a reason why they populate so well in a place like a cow pasture, because very good soil, animals to fertilize, lots of sunlight. That's a big deal. Also, topography makes a big difference, because apples can't survive and pr- reproduce if they're in a low-lying dell where there's late spring frosts. Obviously, right. the higher air where it's, there's wind circulation and whatever... That's the kind of place where you're going to see apple trees that can live through the late spring frost because the air circulation of that hill town, uh, hillside effect or whatever. Um, yeah, because where I live too, one of the things that will happen is if we get that late frost, it's mm-hmm. like no apples that year, or very little apples that year. Exactly. Right? So flat. So microclimate's like, really important. It's not just the climate of your region, it's but it's topography. the microclimate. Yeah. Yeah. So so being able to look at a piece of land and say, oh, that that slope kind of tails off down there. I'm going to stick on the higher part of the slope and say, that's probably where apples are going to be found rather than at the bottom of the hill where cold will generally settle. Mm -hmm. Um, So apples need moving air. They need air movement Okay. for that reason. And because stagnant air is good for mold and apples will just rot and fall off if there's too much mold around. Okay. Is that part of why we prune them out and keep them airflow? up? Huge. I was wondering why the airflow is important. Um, I get this impression around you that I, I just, I'm a generalist forager, you know, yeah, and yeah. I didn't realize even, I feel like being around you, seeing your book, talking to uh, our hosts here, that there's this apple foraging world that I didn't know about. Am I? It's is, true. There's, there's like a little scene kind of going there's on. There's a scene because, you know, wild apples are really, really useful. They're abundant and, um, you know, I'm not the only person who has these ideas. I've been inspired by yeah. a lot of my peers and I have a lot of really close friends who also take part in this work and we take part in it together. And so there is a, there is like a specialist scene of apple, of apple foragers, foragers out there Yeah. that, um, it's a, I tell you, it's a wonderful community. I'm so blessed yeah. to be part of it. That's really cool. And the products that come out of it. So you guys are eating apples, eating apples, cider, cider, Vinegar, I'm sure, is possible. I don't know if you, is that something you mess with? Absolutely. Um, this, let's talk for a second about the apple molasses, because this is a thing that um, Ashley and Matt, who are hosting us here at Red Kill, have told me um, that it's like on the endangered food list or it something. It is, yeah. And so tell us about this as a product. Well, apple molasses is synonymous with a couple other you know, names, cider syrup, Mm -hmm. This can also be called... um, Probably a more accurate name for it. Yeah. And and what it is is uh, fresh juice that's been boiled. The water content has been um, lowered by evaporation until you you have a a liquid that's, you know, much thicker. It's kind of like maple syrup, a little bit... In viscosity. In viscosity, yeah. But it's darker. It takes less boiling to achieve that result. And it is totally shelf stable because acids from... Oh, right. The apples, as yeah, well as the, the high sugar content, are self-preservative. It's, um, I was saying to you today, uh, Grant, you were at breakfast, so you didn't get to have any, but the maple, the uh, apple molasses, the flavor is a bit savory. It reminds me a little bit more of birch syrup okay. than maple, and uh, like you'd want to put it on meats, oh. you know, like it's got that kind of a flavor to it. Um, but then, yeah, tartness and all of those... Um, mineral notes in there yeah. i was saying so almost metallic but i don't mean that in a negative way but like like slate and mineral yeah. and graphite and all these kind of like interesting um metal like f- notes to a copper and stuff like that yeah um but just a cool product but that was an important sugar for people in the past huh? absolutely i mean that you can add apple molasses to the list of things that would be, would have been very very important in the American pantry of you know a couple mm-hmm. centuries ago. And that's, and just, that's just cooking down the juice. Just cooking down the juice. You don't have to which, add which any. Which they were telling me you can anything? do in an evaporator pan. What's the difference between juice and cider? There essentially is none. I mean, th- that's another can of worms, but I'll I'll just sum it up quickly. Um, cider refers to the alcoholic beverage. 
it's often in America confused for sweet cider or fresh cider. Okay. So fresh cider is just fresh juice. And what about that horrible juice that you get that's like kind of clear? That is um, apple juice from concentrate. Oh, really? Yeah. If it's clear, it's bogus, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also being made from sweet apples, right? Because... I don't believe so. Oh, no. Be- no. The the growing of proper sweets on a commercial scale has all but stopped. There are very few oh, okay. proper sweets that are being grown. Okay. And a proper sweet is one that has no or very, very low acidity. And those are the kinds of apples that would be reserved for molasses. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. That'd be the goal. Historically But, but, but I, I guess, all right, so I'm, I'm not using the correct lingo. I guess what I tr- I'm trying to say is that whatever, you know, is in Mott's Apple sauce, yeah, yeah, apple yeah. juice from concentrate. You're not getting any bitter flavors or complexity there. Like they're no. they're using varieties of apples that are extremely mild to the palate. Yeah, stuff right? always grossed me out. Give me a headache. Oh, it's it made brutal. me cough. Huh. It would give me like a almost like pseudo asthma when I would <laughs> eat applesauce, and I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, cider, fresh cider. The other thing is like when you press cider, I mean, it's just instantly oxidized. Yeah. It's brown right away. I mean, many of the apples we've been eating, you take a bite out and you just look at the flesh and it oxidizes very Before rapidly. Before your eyes. Yeah. 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 Um, so also applesauce would be another yeah. end product. A huge, a hugely important one. Um, the apple chips is at, something they've been doing here. Yeah, and dehydrated apples. These are all things that played a super important role in in you know, historical use of apples Mm -hmm. and are ways that we should be using apples on a larger scale that we aren't really doing. Apple butter? Apple butter. I mean, apple butter is kind of your apple sauce, but caramelized to like cook down a little bit. And then you work with apple wood, right? I do work with apple wood. Oh yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I've seen um, scythe handles here and the scythe being, you know, that Am I, do you yeah. like my pronunciation of that? Yeah, or scythe. Not like it. Okay, I've heard it a few ways. Um, the the scythe is a tool that you've been using at the base of apple trees in part of your collection technique, or, or at least that's what we've been doing here. Right. So um, something that Matthew said to me earlier today was, this is, this is um, safer for the tree than a weed whacker because we're not going to accidentally cut into the bark of the tree because the blade, the sharp edge, is curved away from the tree trunk, right? Right. Um, so you were going, kind of carving out a little crop circle around the tree trunk, exactly. so we could lay tarps down, shake those trees. Oh, which we should talk about as well, because um, there's a name for it that I think is great. A name for shaking the trees? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that what we've been talking about. Well, let's come back to that for a second. <laughs> so you've got I saw scythe handles there. that that you'd made from applewood. Applewood, um, sometimes other handles. kinds of wood. Um, applewood does have a tendency against the straight and long growth. Oh, and so okay. for the scythe snaff, which is that long staff, often use other woods, but oh, for okay. the handles. Those oh, are that's very, the handles were applewood. Yeah. And then your saw handles. It's yeah, like I, Japanese pole saws that you were using. Exactly. I use, I use a silky pole saw blade and I mount it on a a handsaw handle that's meant to be wielded with two hands. And mm. th- this just comes from my... I use handsaws every day in my work as an arborist, and I just am so displeased with the kinds of handles and the the ergonomics and the attention paid to actual practicality and practical use. Because those silky blades are quite nice. They're amazing. I have have a couple. They're beautiful. The handles are kind of junky plastic. Yeah, they're usually rubber or plastic. I prefer to use I prefer to use apple wood or you know wood from trees that I'm yeah. working on because that just feels like the most personal connection because yeah. if you're going to take material away from a tree you should you should do it lovingly you know so yeah what else do you make with the apple wood anything else um at the moment that's it other than other than spoons and just you yeah. know household knickknacks and stuff such a good wood for smoking things too mm-hmm. it is just what a tree right you can see why this tree has followed human beings around the world it's the ultimate yeah Wow. Um, what's the kind of future for you look like? Where's Where's your work headed around apples and, and what do you, where do you see the future? Well, um, I see apples and orcharding as sort of a format or, or a, a gateway to a, a certain style of land management being my next five to ten years of just, just working within systems where there are apple trees growing um, in a seedling format um, with other animals, whether they're livestock or encouraging wildlife, um, just sort of designing land use systems and farm systems um, 
around the harmony that apples and wildlife can have for a piece of land. That's really what gets me up in the morning these days because mm. I'm currently uh, establishing silvo pastures, which are, you know, intentional combinations of livestock and trees at Preservation Orchard, which is the headquarters of Carr's Cider House, the cider label for which I work. So that that work is hugely rewarding. It's been hugely successful so far. And I just hope to continue down that path, keep learning and spread that, that you know, the, what I'm going to be learning personally uh, so that others can use that as a model. And I want to just give this piece of advice that I heard for foragers from you, um, who, if they're going to go out and mess around with apples and we'll tell them where they can get this book here in a second. But that's if you're going to blank, you should always knock on the door first and ask permission. Um, so I, I, my only touch point to this was there's a brand out of the UK called scrumpies. And so I was asking you about that. Uh, and you were like, Oh no, no, no. Scrumping is different. So can you kind of like explain the scrump word? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's <laughs> another funny word like Pippin where it has a couple different meanings that are really built into the like colloquialism of apple culture, but scrump. Of which there's a lot. You've, yeah. you've dropped many a term on me the last <laughs> two days that I'm like, wow, there's a whole apple vocabulary in this culture that I just yeah, wasn't it gets aware of. pretty nerdy but um <laughs> to, I don't think it's nerdy I think it's surfer oh I'm, I'm I think it's that. surfer I'm I think it's that. like dude scrumping it's like it's scrumpin', that's not nerdy dude. yeah so <laughs> you know gnarly pippin is like dude gnarly <laughs> pippin it's not it's pretty surfer pop a pips yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Um, so scrump as a verb is to to scrump to scrump Shake a tree and gather the apples without permission. <laughs> Just like that's so great. Yeah. So listen, guys, if you're gonna I scrump, think he's, I think last night he said vigorously. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With an intent to leave quickly. Yeah. yeah. You're, you were not, to... you're not lingering if you're scrumping. Right. Yeah. So scrumping is really a, t a verb for sort of like you know stealing apples or basically pulling apples without permission. Yeah. Because it's hard not to when you see a tree that you know they're not eating off of. They're falling all over the ground. No one's touching them. It, yeah, no, it's I mean, home. you just kind of want to stop, but the, the, <laughs> the teaching from, uh, you know, another mentor to me, um, actually from the state of Maine is just as simple as you always knock on the door yeah. because so you don't if, scrub? It's, if, if, if there's, uh, a, <laughs> I'm not saying I've never scrub. I'm not saying I've never, so you don't have a, you don't have a scrumping tarp in your car. <laughs> I, 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 roll, I roll around with a tarp and at least three bushel baskets wherever I go yeah, and a yeah. scythe and a, maybe a little picker pole too. <laughs> you have to be ready, but. It, you know, it's just very disrespectful. I ain't saying right. I'm not going to scrump, but I try not to scrump. <laughs> Look, I've been I've been stopped. I've been mm -hmm. you know a couple uh, one or two times, and I swore I'd never do it again. But you know, I really I really angered this guy because he was like, "Dude, I make cider from that." Like, uh, and I was yeah. like, "Oh, fuck what a God, dick I am!" Yeah. And I just said, "Here, these are for you. They're ripe. Please, um, you know, accept my apology." And to offer the fruit. Mm -hmm. as an apology is like oh of course yeah. that's all that's that's the most here's you your fruit if, back <laughs> if, you've, if you've made a mistake like that yeah. however um most people are pretty receptive though yeah so scrumping you know if if there's no house around and you're like you're surrounded by woods on all sides there's a big apple tree you want to scrump it go for it don't you know? show up though i on my suggestion if you're gonna knock on the door i like to bring my wife it just smooths things. But don't go Johnny Appleseed style barefoot with a pot on your head. Yeah, and like a raccoon in your bag. <laughs> yeah, don't have a raccoon <laughs> in your bag. Yeah. And um, so, so the other definition of scrumpy, scrumpy as an adjective, describes cider. So in, in England, if you say, oh, give me a glass of scrumpy, you know what that means. Uh, okay. Uh, scrumpy can also describe cider, meaning that it's hazy and the pectins are set in solution and it won't clarify even after fermentation. Because it won't come out of solution and Exactly. Settle. And so that 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 also is another use of the word scrumpy. For for scrumpers with permission out there who want to get the wild apple foragers guide, where do they get? Where do you like to um, have people go for this book? So my website gnarlypippins.com is the best place to go, and I've got a little web shop there where you can find the wild apple foragers guide. You can find scion wood of very noteworthy wild apples oh, seasonally. You can find my tree tools, which yeah. are hand saws with custom apple wood handles. And uh, you can find my blog, which has my other other waxings and ramblings on this stuff. And uh, Instagram. Yep, Gnarly Pippins. Instagram at Gnarly Pippins. That's Just me. search Gnarly, Gnarly Pippins. Pippins, bro. Oh, Gnarly <laughs> Pippins, bro. <laughs> oh, man. What was that? Big Pippin? Big Pippin. Planting seeds. Planting seeds. <laughs>
Picking ain't easy, but it sure is but fun. But it sure is fun. <laughs> hey, man, it's been awesome connecting Thank you with so you. Much. Thanks so much. I've learned a lot from you in those last couple of days. It's a real honor to be on your show. I've, I've loved your show for a long time, so Thanks, I really t- appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, let's stay in touch, and I hope you come up to Maine soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.